uh, fire give environmental uh, uh, information that is going to be very valuable for your HOA to take back, especially in light of the wildfires. And then we have Chief John Whitney here from the Chief from Superstition Fire and Medical. And we really appreciate him being here as well. He will talk about FireWise. And SAC is here as well. So that's wonderful. And then Mr. Surdy, you want to introduce yourself? Supervisor yeah, Jeff Surdy. Looks like I'm not going to talk for about 20 minutes. <laughs> I would like to ask though, did we get everybody represented? I don't see the folks that live south of 60, like Montessa. I, I'll uh, talk to you privately about that. I reached out to them. So maybe it's, in, it's, in the least, maybe send them a summary. I will. So that I they will. can come next time. Yeah. I'll talk to you about Alan and the corporation that runs it, and like they said. Okay, after the meeting. I've been talking about it, so we'll talk about it after the meeting. <laughs> All right, wonderful. But we do have 90% um, uh, of our communities in Gold Canyon represented, either here in person or on Zoom. So thank you for that. Well, I'm going to turn it right over to Alan, and he's going to kick us off. So the speaker here? Yes. Yeah, okay. And can everybody hear okay on Zoom? Hopefully. Jerry, can you hear? Uh, Alan's going to speak up here. Let us know if you can hear, Jerry. Hey, the, very good, Alan. Hear you fine. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks. Um, so, my name is Alan Sinclair, um, and I did this presentation for the first time last December, and it's changed a little bit over the past year. Um, but if we go to the next slide, it tells you a little bit about me. Um, I've got 34 years of wildland fire experience here locally. Um, I rookied on the Tonto National Forest, the Mesa Ranger District right here. Don Vandrell was my district ranger when I got hired, and he uh, had the pleasure of raising me as a young wildland firefighter, a wild land firefighter. Okay. Um, I became an engine captain. I ran the station, the Goldfield Fire Station at the Lower Salt River. Um, and then I got a certificate of ecology and, and fire management from NAU. And that certificate really made me a better fireman because I started understanding the ecology of fire and, and what drives fire. Um, I was really good at going and putting fires out, but that made me step back and think about the actions we were taking and what what those actions, the you know, what types of issues they may cause. Um, I became a fire management officer for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. I ran the wildland fire program for five tribes uh, around town. I had Fort McDowell, Salt River, Gila River, Akchin, and then Pasco Yaki down south of Tucson. And at the end of my career, I was one of our national type one incident commanders. And at that time, there were 17 national teams. Um, I, I was the incident commander for one of them. And one of the fires we managed was right here in your community. It was the Woodbury fire um, that our team had in 2020, which was the very first large fire in the country uh, during COVID. So not only were we challenged with the fire, we were challenged with how we were going to manage bringing firefighters from around the country and to fight it and follow the COVID mitigations. Um, now I've retired. Um, and one of the fires that I had, uh, the next slide, was the Bush fire. Uh, that one, the back one, it was the, if you can go back, no, but the bushfire was there, it disappeared, there it is. Okay. So the bushfire, um, it was 189,000 acres, and we lost a lot of uh, Sonoran Desert, and the footprint of many little fires I put out in my forest service career um, was engulfed in that fire, and fairly heartbreaking for me to see, you know, this big chunk of country that I've spent my career protecting burn up. And um, so I've got a, a private company now. I, I have a 20 person wildland fire crew. We're based out of the Goldfield Ghost Town. We're on a national contract with the Forest Service. We've been in Idaho this year. We've been in Utah this year. And we've been around the state on fires. Um, go ahead and go to the next one. There was a, yeah, there, I thought it looks like it's skipping too, but maybe not. You can go ahead and go to the next one. Um, back one. There we go. 
what, what's happening when these fires burn, and, and this is a fire uh, star, this is part of the bush fire. I took this photo two days ago. Um, you see this dead component coming in. So this is probably a Palo Verde tree. And then all these saguaros that used to be in here are dead. There's a couple live ones up top, but the majority of them are dead. This is from a couple weeks ago. Our crew is on the wood fire south of um, Superior. And this is the accumulation of invasive grasses and fine fuels um, in the three years post telegraph fire. So in just three years, you see this much accumulation of fuel. And what this fuel makeup is similar to, it's not the same plants, but it's very similar to the campfire um, that caused the issues in Paradise, California. They had a fire about 10 years previous to that fire and grasses filled in, there was invasives in there, but there was all this, also this dead component. And that fire um, caused 85 fatalities and um, 18,000 structures lost. This year, we had the watch fire at San Carlos where that community lost 13 homes and, and displaced a bunch of people. And that fire, very similar to these conditions, it's, it's the grasses and fine fuels that are, are coming up to communities, infrastructure, and, and taking out our desert. Um, we're watching the Sonoran Desert turn into a grassland savanna. The next time this burns, you won't see any of the dead saguaros because they're gonna be dried and, and burn up and it just is becoming more and more a, a grassland. We can go to the next one. Um, you know, we're seeing impacts to communities. Uh, this was my buddy's uh, aunt's house in San Carlos. Um, you can see it was just kind of some, some grassy fuel that burned up into the, the structures. This is the wood fire. This is two weeks ago over there south of Superior. Um, saguaros that had made it past the, um, the telegraph fire are now being consumed in the, the next fire just three years later. Um, and then this fire here, um, the, those fuels actually took out that wooden infrastructure that SRP had. This is over by the Goldfield Ghost Town. I don't know what the name of that one was. Seems like there's more and more fires um, that I see on the horizon from my house. I'm always taking pictures of smoke when I see it. And it's more than I've seen in my, my career, um, more than I saw in the 90s and the 2000s. Our fires didn't really get that big until about 2002, we had the Cage Creek Complex. And that was really the first indication that the desert's capable of producing these large, large fires. And what's happened is the Sonoran Desert has been patchy. You know, there's there's open space in the Sonoran Desert that's being filled in with these invasive plants and grasses. And so now what we see is horizontal continuity. That means across the landscape, there's fuel that feeds the fire and it's not broken up by the natural patchiness that the Sonoran Desert once had. So we're losing it. Um, go ahead and go to the next one. The current uh, fuel break, so when, when I retired and got my business up and running, we got signed up as a contractor for the state and they said, we're gonna have you build fuel breaks. And um, I was really excited about doing something to build fuel breaks, but this is what they had us doing. We're cutting a lot of green vegetation. Um, we're lifting up the canopy of the trees off the ground and we're taking out the, the native plants that have been there for a long time. I wasn't, happy about cutting special plants, wolfberry, hackberry, big creosotes. Um, I didn't like it and um, I started doing some research. I found a study out of California that said when crews come in and do work like this, there's up to a 300% increase in non-native plants within those fires rates. And that's our problem in the desert. Our problem in the desert isn't that we've excluded fire from the desert. Um, as we have in Ponderosa pine forests that are dependent on a low intensity burn every 10 to 12 years, generally caused by a lightning strike, and then it cleans up the desert or the forest floor. All the dead material falling out of the trees, the little plants that are growing up trying to, you know, take advantage of those open spaces, those low intensity burns clean that up. That's not the problem in the desert, and this strategy is a good strategy around communities, around trailheads, um, there, are, there, is, there is a need for this, and, and Chief will talk more about FireWise and what this means for your community. But what we're seeing, if you go to the next slide, is when we cut, oftentimes crews don't know how to cut and they're butchering the trees, but in these cut areas, we're seeing invasives come in. 
And so we're seeing it within three months in some cases. Uh, we did a big project for the state that looked beautiful. They loved it. It looked like a park. It was all open. And um, three months later, they're out there and they're like, oh, what did we do? Because now we've got stink net moving in. We've got invasive moving in. One of the slides that kind of got lost in here, it showed about eight different non-native species that are moving into the desert, getting a foothold. So when we cause a disturbance by opening up the canopy and letting light in, in the areas that were shaded, now we're inviting the invasives in. So we're enhancing the problem um, with some of our treatments. Um, there's ways to get around that. A lot of people are using herbicides once they cut. Um, so now you're on a cycle of herbicide use. Um, we're doing something different now and we're stepping back from cutting. And if you go to the next one, I'll show you what we're doing. Um, we were taught as a young firefighter to use minimum impact suppression tactics. So that means that we didn't do big burnouts. We didn't cut line. We didn't use dozers in the desert. Um, the, the desert was deemed so sensitive that our suppression actions, we wanted to minimize. And so what we did a lot and a, a lot was carry five gallon bladder bags on our backs and walk the fire's edge and squirt them out. We'd get helicoptered into areas and uh, go attack lightning fires before they got big. Um, that's not common anymore. Um, there's been incidents that, where we've lost firefighters, not necessarily in the desert, but like in Yarnell, we lost 19. So firefighters are more hesitant to have that direct approach, and they're backing off to areas like washes and roads, and they're, they're lighting back burns. And instead of waiting for the fire to get there, they're just burning that fuel away to, to hold that road. So that's a change. We're not, we're not being uh, minimalistic with our suppression tactics anymore. But I thought maybe we could with our strategies for building fire breaks. Go, go to the next one. So um, these are proposed actions that um, I proposed in Monterey, California, at an international conference in December of last year. And when I gave the first part of this presentation and talked about the cutting that was going to, going on, the academics were like, "Who's cutting the desert and why?" And when I explained it to them, they, it didn't make sense to them. So I've got three students from NAU um, funded to work with me. Um, the Southwest Fire Science Consortium hosted a field trip in February to come out and look at the work that's being done. Um, it, it's kind of been this, this rolling um, snowball. Uh, there is a paper that uh, will get shared. Um, it's a case study that the University of Arizona did on the work that I'm about to show you. Um, so what we what we consider doing once that fire break is established, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Um, we need to monitor those fire breaks and and see what the changing conditions are. Because some years you're going to see red brown, some years you might see the um, Sahara mustard, some years you might have both, some years you might have stink net. Um, there's a change with these plants dependent on the moisture cycles that come in. And so we need to understand what's coming into an area that we deem a fire break. And a fire break is a place that we want to take out that fuel that's going to carry fire. So when the fire department shows up, they have a place to make a stand. And um, if, if a fire break looks like the previous photos with the invasives in there, it's going to burn. Fire's going to move right through that. So we want to monitor. We want to understand the conditions. You go to the next one, please. Um, we do hand pulling and we do mechanical uh, removal of the of the plants. This is Silly Mountain. We pulled a bunch of buffalo grass out for Apache Junction Parks and Rec and carried it off the mountain. Um, and this is a client in Scottsdale. And this property here, uh, we couldn't do um, the burning that I'm going to show you in a minute. So we do low intensity burning, but we did cut it down and remove it. And if you go to the next slide, please. Um, well, this is the Goldfield Ghost Town. We took the fountain grass out of Goldfield. Um, fountain grass is a non-native plant, burns really hot, and is up against the buildings, and we removed all the fountain grass out of the Goldfield Ghost Town. Um, but one more slide, please, the next one. Um, this, this shows taking the dead material out. So in the fire break, we take the dead material out. We mow down any of the, the non-native grasses and stuff. And then I, one more slide is probably what I've been looking for here. Um, this is a before and after. So the same area, we've gone in and mowed all this stuff down. We've taken the dead component out. 
will fire come through here? Yeah, but it's going to be less intense. You know, fire in the stubble is maybe going to be a couple inches tall. And so it, it would be something that you could step in and, and, uh, and manage. One more slide, and this should be the numbers. Yeah, so when we cleared it, we hauled it out, we put it in a dumpster, we took out 4.5 tons per acre. So 4.5 tons of dead, dry material and grasses per acre came off that project. And so that's an area that hadn't seen fire and there had been no management strategy. So it was multiple years worth of the red grown. So as that grass crop grows in, it, it dies, new stuff grows the next year, it dies, it gets more and more dense. And the longer the interval is between fire, the hotter that fire is going to burn. So if it burns on year one, when you've got the first crop, it's going to be less intense than year three, when you got three crops and all the dead components. So all this stuff, dumpsters and, and hauled off site. Um, one more slide. Um, we're using low intensity burning. And as you can see, like we've got fire right around the Saguaro here. Um, we've got fire uh, underneath creosote where it is not hurting the plant, but it's very low intensity and it's very surgical the way that we put it down. Um, next slide. Here's a fire break that we burned in along Silly Mountain Road. And you can see the stink net had filled in this area. You can still see the stink net under the, the choya here, but there is a break that's gonna stop fire. It's gonna, it's gonna you know, come up to here. Under high winds, nothing's gonna stop a fire when you have bushfire going across four lines of the B line highway or four lanes. But um, under general conditions, you would have a fire come up and go out along this edge. Could something get in here and then burn? Yes. But what we want to do is create a mosaic to break up the horizontal continuity of the fuels. I like leaving the trees down to the ground. This is on Mountain View Road. And we did the same thing. You can see the grasses in the back. That's what all this looked like. We took out the fuel that's going to carry the fire. Next one. We could be very surgical with it. This is where Dutch Marigold, and we burned a circle around it. But we want to leave the plants. Um, that are the native plants, like this globe chamomile here, um, that, or globe mallow that was um, at seed. So we just burned around it, left it in place in hopes that that plant will um, spread in this area. This is on Mountain View Road, both of these photos here as well. And then next, uh, the infrastructure that we were able to protect. This is Mountain View Road in the 60s. Um, this, this infrastructure was buried in the red brome. It was, you know, knee high. And we were able to come in and lay it down with some weed eaters, pull it away from the infrastructure, and then burn it with propane torches. And this isn't a um, broadcast burn. So we're not letting fire move across the landscape. We're very intentional with where we put it. We put it out as we're, as we're burning the material. Um, so not a lot of smoke when it's just the fine fuels. Um, our treatment, we want to get that heavy dead material out. And if we're going to burn it, we burn that in the wintertime. Um, so pile burning in the wintertime of heavy fuels and then a spring burn. And this burning was done in April of this year. And if you go look at it now, it's still clean. So it was viable through fire season where some of those other fire breaks that have been built are, are no longer fire breaks. They need to be monitored. They need to be maintained. And uh, this is what we're doing here. There may be, yeah, one more, one more slide. I got to um, co-author a paper with some archaeologists when I was working for the BIA, and they were looking at the, the archaeological record of fire in the Sonoran Desert from the Hulukam and other, other uh, uh, ancient people. And fire's been here. They've used fire to clear fields. Um, they've used fire for hunting, you know, big patches of uh, brush that may have animals in there that they want to flush out. They would light that stuff on fire. And what we saw was uh, what was going on in the tribal communities that I was working in. Um, they were doing some of the same stuff today. So you'll see uh, some of the strategies that we're choosing to use um, used in tribal communities right now. And we're talking to um, the San Carlos community right now um, about this next year going in and using some of these strategies to protect their communities um, from, from the fine fuels.
So that should be the last one. Boom. Oh, but yeah, we can look at that one right there. Number three, if you just click on that real quick. Right here, this one. I don't Sorry. Oh, no, it's okay. Oh, maybe it's, oh, it's this. It's all right. There I do this to my property twice a year. And, you know, when we brought out he Road, there was buffalo grass and there was fountain grass, and that stuff burns really hot. So we removed it um, before we burned the fine fuels. Um, I'm interested in air quality. I mean, I don't want to see a bunch of smoke in the air. And if we can, you know, get through these areas, another thing that we do is we take the garbage out, you know, because a lot of, a lot of these fire breaks are along roads. And, you know, when it's burning, you don't want your firefighters breathing that stuff. So we get the garbage out of there. We take the big diameter dead stuff out. We take the big diameter invasive plants out, and then we just burn the fine fuels. And that one is available to like come to your mutual meeting or board meeting, get your recommendations, and have the superstition foothills. Yep, and uh, met with Dave too a couple years ago. Sure. Yeah. So does these uh, invasive plants, uh, the seeds of them germinate because of the fire? I suspect they do. Um, you know, a lot of these plants are coming from areas um, like stink nets from South Africa. Um, and the fan boss in South Africa burns. And a lot of the plants that are adapted to fire, like we're seeing uh, spreading through the desert, um, that's just part of their cycle. Fire is something that they like. Um, I've been collecting seed that falls off um, at different times when we burn um, with weather data and, and temperature data. Um, in, in hopes of germinate, see if it germinates to see if, if we're hitting any markers that actually sterilize it or not. We don't know what good fire in the desert looks like, but what I do know is that fire's here and we're gonna see more and more of it. The siphon fire that we just had is burning in the 20, 20 footprint of the superstition fire. And, and like I showed the photo of the grasses on the wood fire south of Superior, it's ready to go. And it's it's going to burn again and again and again. So the only thing I can think of is when we have periods of time where we don't get the moisture that promotes that fine field growth, we're likely going to have some some years without desert fires as a threat. And in my career, that had been about every ten years, but this period of time seems longer than the the previous periods of time that we've got this problem. It seems fairly continuous. And with the, the sink net, I have no idea what that's gonna look like. I'm actually going to South Africa in about a week and a half, and I'm gonna go see if there's a something down there eating it. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for Al? Well, that slide that was up there be included in the- Yes, it will. Okay. All those slides, great question. Thank you. And then that way that will have that on there. And Alan's contact information. So if there is additional thought to leave the meeting, oh, I wish I wouldn't ask, uh, feel free to, to reach out to Alan. Yeah, we're on social media, um, so you could reach out there. It's uh, the We've got the environmental services, which is where we're doing kind of the burning and our environmental work. Um, but then the fire crews on there too, and that's kind of cool watching what they're doing around. They're just up in basin on the river fire this creature and West fires. Yeah, I, I had to go back and start fighting fire again to be with my youth. <laughs> well, that's a good segue to uh, see some stuff that you introduce yourself, but we have your PowerPoint right here. Go ahead. Okay. Perfect. Thank All you. right. Well, thank you for having us. Uh, my name is John Lee. I'm, I'm the fire chief for Superstition Fire Medical District. 
we cover Apache Junction, Golden Canyon, and Trotter Del Oro, a lot of the areas in between um, those areas. And uh, I've invited Zach Leon. Zach's one of our captains in the organization. He's also one of our uh, FireWise advisors, so certified FireWise advisor. Um, so I invited Zach in to come in and present the uh, presentation on FireWise, and I'll sit here to answer any questions that you have. Um, kind of a quick intro. We did some work um, with the Superstition Foothills Community Owners Association to get that community FireWise um, certified. And that was a, when we, when Zach's going to talk about this, when we go into these FireWise discussions, we really work a lot on collaboration. So we were involved with Alan and his group. We were involved with Department of Forestry and Fire Management. We kind of help guide the communities and help get them connected to the right areas. Um, I want to just take a moment while I have the floor here to really commend Alan and the work that he and his group are doing. Um, what you see here and what the work that Alan's done, and then specifically the similar investor, is not typical. That is not typical what you get just from a firefighter, right? So um, it is next level, and I, I couldn't be more pleased because I'm an Arizona born and raised native, and I just, and my dad's a cattle rancher, I'm a sunflower, and it hurts to see what's going on with the land. So I love the progressive thinking and the approach that Alan's taken. So I do, you know, recommend that you reach out, reach out to us, reach out to him. We have a multitude of resources available to you to help get you uh, the assistance you need to try to attack the kind of guy to be on the right path. So I'm going to turn this over to Zach on the swap chair. So we're going to be a little closer here and let him have that. Thanks for having me. Okay, I'm Zach. I've been in the superstition for seven years, Captain Paramedic. Uh, I also kind of head up with the Wildland Committee, and I'm one of our firewise advisors. So I sat in through some meetings with uh, Superstition Foothills and kind of helped them. It's a learning process for me, too, but helped guide them in the right direction in partnership with Fallon and uh, DFFN, and they're now firewise. So I have. Good job. That's hard work. <laughs> Oh, okay. Maybe this right here. If one of those, uh, maybe the minus. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Oh, okay. Thanks, Alan. All right. So, what is Firewise? So Firewise, it's a program developed by NFPA um, here in the United States to help communities reduce the risk of wildfires. The goal is to encourage residents in wild, wildfire prone areas to take proactive measures to protect their homes and properties. The Firewise program emphasizes creating defensible space around the homes using fire resistant materials and maintaining vegetation to reduce the chance of fire spreading. So firewise, the firewise program is it's more for your homes or properties. You know what each member in your HOA or your community can do to help best protect their homes. And if the whole community gets behind it, becomes firewise certified, um, it gives the best chances to see, you know have manageable fires that may come through your community where it best gives the fire department. Um, you know, forestry, firewater is the best chance to save your property. Some of the key principles, and this is very, you know, very basic. If you go onto the Firewise USA website, it goes straight into detail. You can order booklets for all of your residents or your communities. There's there's a lot of information on um, the Firewise USA website through NPA. But some of the key principles of Firewise is Defensible space. So creating a buffer zone around your home, clearing away flammable materials like dead leaves, grasses, and branches away from your home. Using fire resistant materials. Most of us have tile roofs, so that's that's good. Top metal's the best, but tile roofs perfect. Really don't see like shape shape or anything down here in the desert. So okay. um but yeah, using non-combustible building materials like roofs, sidings, and decks. Um, home maintenance, so regularly cleaning your gutters, eaves, roofs, and removing any debris that could potential fire. 
That being said, also underneath your decks and, and not storing flammable items like seat cushions in that under decks as well, yes. if you have decks on the pumps. Um, point. Vegetation management, keeping trees and bushes trimmed and ensuring that no flammable plants are close to the home. And then community action is just encouraging all of your neighbor neighbors or neighborhoods to work together to reduce the overall risk. Because if, if only a couple of houses do it and the rest 75% of the neighborhood is out of control, then <laughs> you know, tough times, even though you prepared right. So this is a basically a summary of well, this is what we learned out at Superstition that we created and we hand out to homeowners. You don't have to go through the Firewise program to be prepared, you know, as a community. So this is what we hand out, um, whether it's door flyers or we send it in the email, you guys can get this entire presentation today. But um, it's seven, seven ways residents can reduce their risk to their homes and property when um, will become fuel for a wildfire. So again, like, I kind of briefly mentioned, remove all weeds and dead ground cover within 30 feet of your home. Trim shrubs and trees 10 feet from your home. Limb up any um, branches that are less than five feet from your home. Surface fires are okay. You don't want them next to your home, but if so, you don't want to have ladder fuels that will get into the big bushes or the plants and um, house fire and things on the house. So store furniture cushions, mats, plants, and other decorations from decks, porches, and patios. Most importantly, if you if you are snowbirds and you have a bunch of patio furniture, it might be a good idea to just remove those, put them inside while you're gone for the, the months you're gone. Um, remove anything stored underneath decks or porches that could burn. Um, and then move any flammable materials at least 30 feet from your home. So big one is like uh, piles of firewood. You don't mm -hmm. have that stored you know, next to your porch or by your house, stored out in the middle of your property where it's not going to be right up on your house. And then again, probably annually or semi-annually, make sure your roofs are clean, your gutters are clean of any dead leaves or leaves. All it takes is you know, to have a, a developed fire that's throwing embers and it lands on your roof and that one ember with the dirty roof, and then next thing you know, your roof's on fire and, it's, and your house is gone because something that could have been prevented. So if any of your communities or HOAs want to become fire-wise, um, this is the first step is to organize it, plan it, do it and then tell Firewise, which is a portal that you will get if you go through the process. And uh, um, we'll go to the next page here. So organize it. So the first step is to create a board or committee of volunteers to represent your community, including residents and partners, such as local forestry agencies or the fire department, us, and as well as uh, DFFM, state, state forestry. Next one. And then to plan it, so the board or your committee that you create will collaborate with their local wildfire experts to complete a community wildfire risk assessment. This assessment should be a community-wide view that identifies areas of successful wild, wildfire risk reduction in areas where improvements can be made. Emphasis should be on the general conditions of homes and related home ignition zones. The assessment is a living document that needs to be updated every five years. So now, so now you're doing it. And so each year neighbors complete educational and risk reduction actions identified in their plan. These go towards your site's annual reporting efforts. At a minimum, each site is required to annually invest the equivalent of one volunteer hour per dwelling unit in wild, wildfire risk reduction actions. So if your site has 100 homes, then you're gonna have to report 100 hours of work or monetary equivalent based on the independent sector value of volunteer time to give you complete for each year. And that is, 
basically what you have to report each and every year and you import it into the portal on the FireWise USA website and you're one identified member that's in charge on your committee or um, will be the one who's putting all this data year in and year out. And, and that's how you re renew your status and keep that FireWise status active each year. So add Mountain Brook Village is FireWise certified. Yeah. So could you, because you have about 1,700 homes in your community. So do you have someone assigned to, you know, make sure those hours are put in? Great. So you're, yeah. go ahead. You could even ask the five foot breaks here. How does the Washington stuff? So while we're creating a, what you brought up is all the engagement plans that come in. So we're probably going to come up with a volunteer group that has to go back through when it's small every year, like take out all the old weeds and things like that. But yeah, we have a grounds committee that's full of last year. So, Ed, could you share with the group? You know, what would you say is the most important thing, you know, in getting FireWise, obviously, besides just starting it? What would you give? And now that you've gone through it, what recommendations would you give? Yeah, USAA insurance, you get $100 off. Even well, there's motivation. <laughs> Other insurance companies are starting to look at different homeowners and deductions for that. And it brings an awareness to the community, I think. We have a lot of people that have overgrown stuff and watch and buy their houses. Weren't too interested in it. Now, when we brought the firewise thing up, you know, they're now all knocking on the door saying we need to put out our neighborhood. You know, so it's just bringing the awareness to the community. You get some signs for the community like that. Good, great. Thank you, Ed, sharing that. There's one more. Okay. So if anyone is interested, um, go on to the website or you can also contact um, DFFM. We'll walk you through step by step. They're the ones that are going to come out and do your, your assessment. And uh, Aaron Kasem, he is the prevention mitigation officer. Um, this is his contact number. And, even on the Firewise website, when you click where you're from, this is where what will pop up. So this is his contact information. If, and if you are interested in communities or interested in taking that next step in Firewise, and a great resource for any questions you may have on, on that. Is there a fee associated with that, or do they come out voluntarily, or is this a cost yeah. I don't think there's any fee with DF with them, but there is. It, it costs money to be in the, okay. the firewise program each yeah. every year. So, uh, and that's something that makes it stand. So, so one of the things that you brought up, sir, mm -hmm. and, and, and what, what Alan deals with is this fuel management, fuel maintenance. It's an all building thing. And that's something that we talk to you. So, we'll come out and assist with your preparation and your, mm -hmm. and your processing of firewise for your charge, as well as the Department of Forestry Fire Management. Um, Alan's been kind enough to also assist communities in there. You know, he also has a business, though, so we want to be respectful of his time. Um, but one of the things you really have to look at, and we, in, in, in our experience of dealing with some of these associations, is you have to recognize the costs associated with it. So, FireWise is the gold standard, right? It is that certification that gives you the discount on your insurance, et cetera. What we showed you the slide before about the seven steps, there's a lot of things you can do to enhance your own house safety for, um, for wildfire protection and overall general safety. We recommend FireWise if that's something that your community association would like to be a part of, but we're also very upfront about that. Of there are costs associated with that fuel removal, vegetation removal, getting a company like Allen's in to come and do the work that gets that all cleaned up so you can get your FireWise certification. But then the ongoing costs of maintaining that. So now you have the invasive grasses that have grown in. You got to get back into there again to make sure that that's taken care of. So we like to be very upfront with everybody about what that kind of commitment looks like. It's definitely worth it if that's something that your community has an interest in. But it is something that that is you know takes some some work and effort to do. But again, repeating, it is it is the gold standard of what it is. 
if you have a community champion that, that is really passionate, that's what we ran into with the superstition foothills community owners association. Um, they had someone there that was from California from uh, Colorado that had lost the home in wildfire, so they were very passionate about it. They did an absolutely amazing job as putting that together. But it was, you know, not everybody was signed on on board of it. So it took a lot of kind of lobbying and work um, to get that done. I think uh, Alan mentioned, you know, the site and fire and things like that happen close. Everybody gets real, real anxious, real nervous, gets much more open-minded about these types of things. But then as time goes by, those those you know financial costs have an have an impact. So it's something to consider. But there's a lot of ways. It's not be firewise or be nothing. There's a bunch of things in between that Alan spoke to that we can help assist you with as well, just to kind of get an idea. Anything you do that helps protect your home from wildfire helps us give us more of a fighting chance to try to get ahead of it. Is all stuff that will benefit you in the long run in that regard. Any other? You gotta go to firewise. You need to get one really dedicated person. So this is like 35, 40 page mm -hmm. application for photos and things like that. So one person, you know, you gotta get one person that's really dedicated to this thing. The other one, I tell you, the cost of litigation. We've done like the first hundred houses that we think we have to clear out, and we're at about forty thousand dollars in expenses uh, clearing brush and you know, washes and things like that. So. There, there is an expense of, you know, getting us going and maintaining. We have one more community that we recognize the Superstition Mountain um, Golf and Country Club community. So Michael McCarty is on Zoom, and that community also is Firewise. So we have three Superstition Foothills. That is from Mountain Brook, and Michael McCarty is on uh, for the board at Superstition Mountain. So you'll get each, all the contact information of the HOA board. So you can reach out to Ed or um, to the president of Superstition Foothills or Michael and Jerry, and they can also help give, you know, real life examples of how they did it. And I want to see if there's any other questions for John or Zach. Yeah, so just like there's a bunch of ranches and little farms right down the Ranch Road. And they got sneak dead weeds growing right up to the county road. So the county sent them a letter to clear. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, to me, that would be notify the hey, you got a potential fire hazard here. And, well, that's kind of yeah. my question too, is because we have an HOA behind us. That is all it's all open. They've never built um right behind my house. Mm -hmm. They have big clump of trees that are half dead. I mean, we've had to go and actually along the wall because they keep coming over the place. I mean, I have a mesquite tree in my backyard, but I trim it every year down 10 feet. Mm -hmm. And it's probably 20 feet away from the house. When I, you know, I try to keep it trimmed so that it's not an issue. But it blocks the views also of everybody else. But it's just a mangled, bunch of mangled, and it's all the way up and a big L. Yeah. And I've tried to reach out to the, you know, I even talked to the homeowner or the owner of the property. The first year he said, Yeah, go ahead, but send me pictures of what you cut. You must have treated nothing on, you know, yeah. Nobody's gonna build back there and leave that that tree there because it's so mangled and it's half dead. But what do we do? I mean, it's right there. I mean, if I need to go and it comes over the wall, I mean, that would potentially set my tree in a fire versus having that break of the, the back wall. Yeah, the difficulty that, that we deal a lot with when it comes to you know, fire restrictions, fire code violations, things like that, when it gets into private property, especially residential areas, mm -hmm. is not having us come into your personal home or that, that ranch or farm. And, you're telling you here's what you have to do. Mm -hmm. And the concept, so the, the benefit of that is us not coming in and telling you how to manage your house right away. The consequence of that is that your neighbors are not participating, which lets you in that scenario. Majority of the things we deal with with like fire code violations, things like that, are all commercial property, public spaces right. where you you will impact someone else's money. So it does become a very difficult uh, challenge. What we've done in the past is maybe uh, sending out letters of recommendations that someone can do, um, but as far as being leveraging authority in that regard, it's, it's very difficult to do. 
but sometimes just with open conversation community meetings like this, where we discuss that you don't have to always go to the same degree. Anything you can do to just kind of keep things up, you know, help that that impact is, is all something that, that helps. That's from the, the, the superstition fire side of it. From the county, I think you're all in the similar to the exposure yeah. of the you know, COVID that is crazy cold violations. What, what I was going to suggest is as we hand out, you know, without naming names of what community that is, you know, then I could help you with the contact information, perhaps the two communities working together, and it may be just an awareness, you know, and that community board could maybe uh, so that, put it in. There's the, things that are going to happen at the wall. Oh, okay. Start, 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 sure, start sure. Area, you get the big trees, ones that make this heat up those way a lot ways, and it's... You know, and it's not very small. So I know the lips are, I could grow anything in the background of my That's That's the language or Calvary takes all the water. Well, what we could do is get the contact information. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I think one of the three people that you mentioned have a fire wise neighbor that came to speak at a building last year. And she mentioned that she had found a way to get grandfather to help out. Yes. So, so how do you do she that? did? Um, so I was at that presentation. Yeah. I actually put her on the spot, had her come up and tell the story. She, that's what I was talking about. She did an amazing job. Yeah. Um, that was when Harper Forest Street had fuel reduction grants. Oh, okay. That how often Alan that was that a one time? No, they're annual. Are they annual? Yeah, so they'll have a healthy forest initiative funding and then a basic plant grant funding. Yeah. Could you get me the information of how a HOA, if they had a champion or a cheerleader for it to, or, you know, to contact, to submit for the grant, mm -hmm. then I could send it out with the information to the HOAs. Yeah, I believe the work that you've done on City of Mountain has done one of those grants, and I believe Superstition Foothills Association has done something. I think we got like something that was called. I recall, but maybe. But either way, you right. take what you can get. I, I, <laughs> it was significant, and I feel like that's something that really pushed that. Give you, I mean, it's you take money out of it, and when you look at like work out does, when you look at firewise communities, things like that, when you're not doing these things that you're doing, but these landscapes are, are gorgeous. It looks way better, cleaner, just a nice, healthy bed. Right. Oh, we got a question in the back from Phil. Yes, um, I'd like to have your opinion of whether you think ADOT is doing a good job along 60 Highway with all the invasive plants that we have out there. How about the county? Like to speak to <laughs> about other meetings. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, it's, I don't know what their strategy is, man, and I don't know how often they rotate through those cycles. Um, I do think it's something, as, as we've experienced here in fairness to ADOT, the growth and development of these invasive plants due to all the things that Alan was talking about has been astounding. I mean, it's just it's absolutely out of control. And if you think about all that they have to manage, there's only so not trying to defend them or advocate. It's just a matter of this has been a, it, to, to Alan's point of, the landscape is changing and it's not changing in a good way. And it's creating problems like this, where it's extremely difficult for agencies to stay up and maintain those uh, type of things. But they did a bunch of mowing that I thought, you know, that was a good strategy to reduce that fuel loading. Um, there's a lot of buffalo grass along there that will come back, but you know, it's, it's just a strategy to take that risk, reduce the risk. And I think that's what they did is they they reduced the risk by the throwing. Yeah. So do we have any contacts with somebody that we should make a request for more clearing? You know, I'll take that away, Phil. And then that way we could see if we could get a contact to go ahead and 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 uh, see what they can do. A week and a half ago. And it, we, you to Maybe even a schedule then that we can share that they're actually doing. So I'll take that away. Why I asked the question was the fire that shut down the road to Pace, you know? On 87, yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Phil. Well, gosh, let's give uh, John and Zach a hand. 
Not only for the presentation, but the work that they do to risk their lives to help us and their teams. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for, for gracing us with your time this evening. We're, we're going to take a moment to stand up because we have a surprise for Mr. Surdy. Everybody just stand up. <laughs> it is Mr. Surdy's birthday today. <laughs> So we're going to sing happy birthday and we have a cake. We're going to cut pieces and pass out while we continue. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to That's worse than being at a restaurant. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, well, we could all run around you going, have you heard it? <laughs> well, wonderful. Am I up? You are up. Yes. So, 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 for so, so. fire department for seven years, we got hired when it was 14. <laughs> <laughs> so we also, we had another staffer, Paul Mullenix, came in after the introduction. And I also want to thank staff. They've been working all day, and it's now 7 o'clock. They haven't been home. So I appreciate them staying over. This is a long day for them. So thank you for that. I also am amazed. Yeah. I hate using bad microphones. This room has such great acoustics. I'm just talking a little bit louder than normal, and everybody can hear. It's so great to not have to pass around microphones like that. That's cool. And Jerry, online, can you hear everything? Can you hear Jeff? Hey, Jeff, happy birthday. You, you're coming through loud and clear, sir. Thank you. All right. So I might just go rapid fire and leave the, uh, the agenda here a little bit, just about some things that might be coming and things that are happening. Uh, not only the like any birthday wishes all day, but anybody that's on Facebook and the pages, I went out and did a video this morning yes. about the dishes on Peralta Road. Look, I got that number one up there. Yeah. I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> I was getting a ding about every 30 seconds because I was on all the Peralta pages, the Gold Canyon pages. And it was about 90% in favor and 10% that don't understand. And they think that they were trying to do something to them, but it was just so out of control. And this is such a low cost solution to keep the motor homes out of it. The, the ATVs, they do some destruction, but they're not as bad because they leave every day. Those other people were going out there and staying all year long. And you know, they have money because those motor homes aren't cheap. They're just too cheap to get into a park and stay. So, they're probably going to go down to Florence Junction to Cottonwood Canyon next, but that's out of sight, out of mind down there. Let me go down there. But uh, if you want to see, I took some videos of how they did that and show us. Everybody is really, really like to pass on the words there. Sorry, that's a jumping through that picture. Yeah. Um, is that in the front, there are some signs. and the signage will make it all tie in too, and it also make law enforcement. Uh, easier. So one of the questions was, why didn't the sheriff's department just patrol it? Yeah. Where are they? They're this the county of the side of Connecticut. We don't have the manpower to station one person there all the time. And it's state land. It's not our land. Why should we? The state land makes millions of dollars when they sell their land. Get a dedicated person and take care of their own land. Why should we have to do it and they don't even reimburse. At one time, I guess like 20 years ago, they used to reimburse and do it just like they did with their officers. Their officers, somebody has to pay that their officer's salary. And state land was doing that. They stopped doing it, but they want us to do it for free. And state land, the state is better funded than the county. So, so that's part of it as well. Um, and Carter Del Oro. You get two big chunks of private land on the way in there, and you'll notice a lot of activity there. So we've all been spoiled for a long time, and it's that way with private land everywhere. 
when when I was mayor or with Pastor Junction, something would start going up in an empty lot. But I walked my dog on that empty lot, and it, it's been private forever. Somebody's going to build there, and so we can control and make sure that it's up to code and whatever. But we may not get the projects we would like to see there, or you know, stay empty forever, and, and that's that's just the way it might be. Uh, the two parks at Florence Junction, I know that they seem to be on hold right now. There's one on each side of the road. And I don't know why they're not being developed. Uh, do we know, Gilbert? Mm -hmm. There's just no money in it for them? Or... Mm -hmm. On the Neon Ranch and the other one was so like... Yeah, that, that we like to hear on the Neon Ranch. Yeah, so just a little bit, you know, so the, the project that I'm trying uh, for the park that's supposed to be going there, but I believe the property is being sold to another developer. And as of this point, that's volunteered, so there's no development yeah. moving forward. There's some ADAC controversy going on now, so we need to the project's on hold. The project's on hold. We haven't seen any type of thing get to build it, um, but we have this now. It is so favorably, they just need to have a project that works right there. Well, but in the capital, we've got more of this project. Yeah. A few things with that. Uh, and Gil Gilbert, you're a director of planning and zoning? No, no, no. I'm just oh. the planning manager. Well, I was I was giving you a promotion um, right yeah. there. <laughs> 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 okay. I don't know. <laughs> so we probably everybody here goes maybe once a year, but the great news. And it's not even in Pinal County, but we were able to get Highway 88 over to Fish Creek Hill. You can now drive all the way around. Don't drive a car. Even though a car could make it, there's signs up that say four wheel drive only and no trailers. I think they're going to soften on the no trailers because you pull fast boats on trailers, but they just want to make sure to see how it's working at first. That was a four or five year effort. A lot of people involved to get that open. and. Uh, when I get visitors, that's where I take them. I don't go to Sedona or Scottsdale. That's you can see almost all of Arizona in that one trip, and it's amazing. So we're glad to be able to do that. The uh, community cleanup that we had last year was a rousing success, and it was right after Christmas in the parking lot of the community church that used to be the grade school. And afterwards, everybody said, well, I wish you would have known about it. Well, this year, you're going to know about it. And we expect so much participation. It's going to be two days this time with more dumpsters. So refrigerators, barbecues, all the stuff that won't fit into your roll-off dumpster, uh, bed frames, mattresses, things like that. There's no, no hazmat. No hazmat. Who will take tires? Tires, yes. Tires are a problem. So... You know, a lot of you HOAs don't allow that anyway, but still, I mean, a lot of people have a barbecue, you just can't get it up in the dumpster. So, that type of thing. So, okay. And Jeff, yes. what's the dates? Yeah, I think it's January 20. A lot of Christmas trees went in there because it was right after Christmas. There's always sales. And if I was just going to commend at how smooth it was, if yeah. you didn't have a chance to go, I drove right up. I mean, there was two or three people that came right to the back of my SUV, took it out, threw it in the pile, and I was on the way. So it was very efficiently run, and I encourage you all to take that. Free. It's free. So thank you, Jeff. That's, yeah. It's awesome. It's going to be two consecutive days. Yeah, January 31st and February 1st. Yeah. 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 So let's get back onto the schedule then. The Maverick Station is spotting along, but the Dairy Queen is in some roadblocks. Todd, where are we on? I'll let Gilbert pick up. He's the director. So the Dairy Maverick, um, you know, it's like that. So no way for ADOT approval for it. What we want to do is what I do, sign for it, John. Very few of them hold, they're still playing the bush in the Maverick in regards to the customer. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. But they're just waiting for you to So we have no idea of when the Maverick might open. Because I get it, get asked them somewhere. Yeah, we, we reached out to them and we're waiting for a response to them. 
Yeah, as soon as they know how to approve their plan to make them get a permit and start building. So really just waiting for the dot. And I know I got some staff changes, some of my contacts there are no longer that they got. I got some new ones reached out to them. Were they planning so, on putting an extra? Oh, go ahead. We, uh, He's probably going to ask the same question. In the third lane yeah. in the third <laughs> yeah, so they'll, so they'll be doing right now. He has 60 under capacity. Yeah, they'll be putting in over capacity guys, especially January through April. So, so they won't be doing a third lane on US 60, but it'll be a dual left turn there at King's Ranch. So they'll be doubling the turn lane, the left turn capacity, uh, which is going to be a pretty big improvement. For the area and how about superstition mountain i don't know where all those people go in there but you can never be driving through without somebody turning in there's a lot of professional people you know plumbers i see people are always going up there isn't that going to get a little bit longer to turn out as well that's that would be a dot project for some kind of real know about that okay and uh i got some questions this week it's only 60 or 63 homes, you know, where they didn't blast and where the movie ranch used to be. Somebody asked, how is King's Ranch Road going to handle that traffic? That's only 120, 180 extra people. But Joe, what is the plan on King's Ranch Road eventually having sidewalks the whole way? It's not going to be really wide, but what is the yeah. plan for that? That's the tag team here, Chris, but... Uh... Yeah, so right now on our PIM plan, our five year plan, we do have the dollars allocated for King Ranch and for all of them in the year 25 26, I believe. But that's not necessarily to widen the road, that's for the, those dollars for rehabilitation, uh, maybe a mill and overlay, uh, not necessarily widening in that kind of aspect. Uh, we, we do. So whenever we make improvements like that, the uh, arterial like this, it, it, we have to have some uh, analysis data to kind of make us add additional lanes. That's what drives drives that stop. If it, it, it has to take out its objective, we have to make it just have more of an analytical uh, thought to it. Uh, so right now we, we don't have data that supports widening it. Uh, but that's something that I'll exactly look at later to find out if, if that's the case. Or there, there may be some accident that we don't have that. And with regards to the subdivision, the 63 lots the supervisor mentioned, uh, they will be putting in a right turn to help move the traffic off of King Grant as they slow down and turn into the streets. So that is a requirement of that development. So it'll be off to, to like into the Lutheran Church or kind of there as well. Yeah. Passion, Mountain Whisper. Okay. Yep. We're talking about a vegetable moment right yep. now. <laughs> I went on the desk so I could see when the quiet hours are. And it's supposed to be 11 to 7 a.m. When I called the sheriffs, they said it's, well, it can start at 6 a.m. I can tell you those big caterpillars are running up and down at 5 40. And it's horrible. Um, so I'm going to All the houses are supposed to work. Yeah, I'm sorry. What is all this? Right now, it goes, the construction period it goes from April to October 15th. And if they're doing concrete work, they can start at 5 a.m. If they're doing any other kind of construction, it's 6. When we get October 15th, it bumps in now. So then the concrete work will be 6 a.m. And any other kind of construction will be seven eight. But she's saying they're doing it early now. Well, yeah, the caterpillars are at five forty. I don't live, I don't back up to them. Oh, yeah. A neighbor of mine does back up to them and has a house on the market. And I was going today at 5 p.m. and I went to pick her up to take her out of the house. And the caterpillars and equipment and the people are going to get all right behind the house. It's yeah. But they do start by five forty. If they're going outside of that, like if they're not doing the concrete work or the start work, if you want, I can call them. And normally, the person who's managing the project really doesn't know that they're starting too early. And a lot of people aren't even aware of the noise limits. 
so I can get the literacy of the manager in that project and just talk to them about it. It's not an enforcement type thing, but normally they'll agree to go to the need or Okay. Back to King's Ranch Road, the uh, crosswalk went in pretty uneventful. There were some people against it for some reason. The rules are very simple. If there's people in the crosswalk, you're not allowed to run over. We've all followed that. Everybody will be safe. The uh, my office is very reachable and available. We got tons and tons of communication on the cell tower. Way more were in favor of it. I ended up being a no vote on it. I wish that it went a different direction. It is going to be ugly. We are going to hold them accountable. The limbs don't fall off, however it looks. But I don't even know that it's going to go around Dinosaur Mountain and get up into the canyons. I think it would have been better than something called small cell that goes on to existing. Like three of those at 20 some feet off the air would have been more effective than this big 75 foot thing. So that was the reason for my no vote, even though we do know that we do need it out here. When is that expected to start? Do you know, Jeff? To get a permit? Yeah, the site plan is to make sure it's in an area where it doesn't meet the other buildings. Okay. It's a pretty simple process. Mm -hmm. You're required to do so on the walls around it. That's perfect. So once that like, gets done, it'll go pretty quick, about a couple of months, maybe three months, because of how simple it is. Then I'm going to get to the end of our permit. So you should see it go around like, say, about 60 years. And Gilbert, when that goes up, does your team like someone come out and like check it to make sure it's we don't we have the inspectors that come out the inspection part to make sure it's still safe. Okay. So but um, <laughs> my job is in regards to them, we verify that it's in the right spot, you know, it's not a case of anything to say anything, then it goes to a different company that permits it. Okay. The good thing is bashes should not be struck by a lightning. Oh, good point, <laughs> it's taller. Yeah. <laughs> But it's not going to be any taller than the power line poles that are out there. So, Probably not, though. And I mean, you get more electromagnetic energy off the power lines than you are these 5G towers. So I don't understand why all these people are raising their commitment about that. All right, the next thing I don't have any good answers for, and that's the uh, Air Force training that's coming back. It's never really gone away. We tried to beat this thing down a few years ago. I don't know why they think they need to come over here. If you go from Hilo Bend to Yuma, there's something called the Copa Range. There's no people there, and there's only some creosote over there. We not only have people, but we have vegetation, and they want to do it in the summer when it's flammable. They do it in January, you know. So the reason I bring up the flammable is because they started the which fire? They claim they did it, but they did. There, there's been a few flares found on different fires. I'm not yeah. sure which one. So what they know is you know how we, we've all seen Top Gun, how they'll drop flares to get to divert the missiles. So they train on that. And they're also going to be dropping aluminum shavings like confetti out there and that is going to scramble the radar etc if we go out there and we start dumping aluminum shavings we'll get fined for dropping that into the wilderness and the forest so why should they be allowed to so this is a federal issue we are a lot of people are raising a lot of stink and do raise more when it comes up but uh eli crane and andy biggs who has covers our area they're aware of it they have access to the Air Force. And uh, and I really don't. Uh, remember Paul Gozar, he, he did a good job representing us. I did bring his office into it. He has the area where they should be over at the Copa Ranch. And they claim that one branch, that one base over there, doesn't want them over there because they want to train themselves. Well, they just need to reserve it and schedule it around there. That's that's, that's terrible that, that they want to do that out here. And it's all the way to New Mexico. 
And uh, if it comes to it, I have the uh, mayors and supervisors of the communities to the east of the Safford and everybody that they, they will be against it as well and secure. So yeah, I could speak to that real quick. Uh, I just put together a quick presentation for Terry. Uh, hopefully she's including it when she sends it out. This is just, just the facts. Terry said no opinions allowed. Uh, but this is just the facts of the changes that the Air Force wants to make uh, to their lowest. And it's significant changes. Um, flights will drop from 3,000 feet to 500 feet above ground level. Supersonic will drop from 30,000 to 5,000 feet. Um, you will hear them, I can guarantee it. Um, even though we, Gold Canyon's proper is not in a mode, we've got the Laura, Queen Valley, Superior, uh, Miami Globe, they're all in that MOA and they are going to hear it. And dropping flares 1,000 feet lower than their current uh, location, the 3,000 and they're dropping from 2,000 feet, they're allowed. So uh, what I suggest is, and on this uh, presentation, there's a spot to put a comment in the draft for their draft EIS. By NEPA, they are required to respond to every single comment. So please send out notes to your, your HOA members, put comments on there, barrage them with comments. We need to tell them we're not happy. We don't want changes. Keep it as is. I think we'd be fine with that, but we've got to get comments on their EIS. If we, if we ignore it, they're going to take advantage of us and it'll get worse. So the comments are open for whether you're this anybody, against anybody. or if you're for yeah, it as yeah. well to for or against. Or against. Yeah. So yep, it's for both. administrator. We we tried to get the Air Force to come back because that meeting came and went. People didn't even know about it. Right? Mm -hmm. So we've been asked and we just have a meeting among ourselves. We, it does no good for us to just yell at each other if they don't hear us. Exactly. You've got to get representatives there from the actual Air Force. Yeah. But I think Jeff, I attended one of those meetings and there is there was no conversation with the Air Force. They would not, we couldn't negotiate or talk. It was just, here's the facts and then we could speak and that was it. There was no back and forth. Yeah. Cool. Has anyone uh, heard anybody describe the flight path from Luke Air Force Base out to here and back? I cannot get anybody to indicate where they're going to fly how they're going to get here and go home can terry just pull up the the moa page uh, no, yeah no uh so looks like they're going to be coming from tucson well they're also the two bases in tucson will come here or can come here yeah. um and luke air force base so steve edwards and i have been looking at that flight radar he's really keen on flight radar just so you know uh but <laughs> But it does, we've tracked a few of the flights out of Luke Air Force Base, and they basically come straight east and come right across Gold Canyon into the Outlaw Moor. So they do come straight across. Uh, most of the ones that we see, we don't see them go up and around or down and over in the, in the unpopulated areas. They come straight across. I guess my concern is Phoenix Airport and the airport close to us here. With all the fight that we have. Can, can I add something? Go ahead, Orlando. Oh, Phil, we go ahead. We'll take that as as far. We'll stick topic to the Air Force, and maybe we'll come to that in a future meeting. But thank you, Phil. Go ahead, Orlando. Okay. Um, the first time I heard about this issue was on the uh, community social network, and I read some of the descriptions on how these aircraft are going to operate. Uh, some of the things that was really alarming to me was the fact that there was a lot of misinformation. So let me give you an example. I retired from the FAA for after 20 years as a uh, aircraft mechanic and just an overall uh, airport operations type of person. One of the things that these military aircraft have to do by the rules is on takeoff and landings, they must follow all commercial aircraft rules and regulations. So when I heard that these guys are going to take off an afterburner, uh, on occasion, that may happen, but it's not a daily routine. Uh, noise abatement uh, has always been a big deal for them. In, that, in mind, I'm not supporting them, I'm just giving them some information so that it's a better idea of what's going on. And so 
the, the whole idea is they have to get from point A, which is the, the Air Force base, and they're going to have to go to the MOA, which is your military operations area. When they get to that area, uh, my understanding is the environmental impacts have been minimized. And there's oh, I'm get it, but, but, but there appears to be a lot of misinformation regarding this topic. And one of the reasons I wanted to come here in particular was that. Okay. That's great. It reminded me of something, too, when you talk about breaking. We are finally going to be getting some signs on 60 for engine braking, jade brakes. Mm -hmm. So, Chris, where are they going to be? They're going to be coming in from Superior, right? Yeah, um, it'll be, well, I don't know the exact location. Just east of Gulf Road, and then I'm on the other side, it's before Superstition Mountain. Okay. Yeah, but that's in the permit process right now. Depending on the weather conditions, you just hear that on the downshift there. So, so that's good. That, long time to get ADOT to the table. Uh, ADOT's finally picking up the trash. That was not the county. We don't want it's supposed to pick up the trash on, on uh, 60. Um, these folks can't talk about it because they're paid by the county, but I'm a private individual. But you got ballot measures coming up. Um, one of them, 486, it's not a new tax. It's a tax that's been there for almost 40 years. It's a half cent you're already paying, and it's what funds a lot of what they do. If that goes away, then these things are gonna be bad. So it's not a new tax. It's maintenance. It's, it's a maintenance tax. Now in 2026, the PRTA, the Canal Regional Transit Authority, is probably going to try for one that would be a tax increase. And that would, uh, that's the one that passed. And they had it where the lobbyists had where the car dealers didn't have to pay it over $10,000. They got called illegal. All that money's still in a kitty somewhere. They're sitting on it. They can't use it. It's like $87 million still is there. <laughs> But that that was so important. I was disappointed that Gold Canyon didn't vote for it. And I I'm a Republican, even though a lot of PCCI is Democrats. But we're supposed to be anti-tax, right? But we'll we'll pay taxes if you could see the results. Of, and that was going to build. It would help with the 24. And so a lot of people in Gold Canyon said, "Well, it's not going to help with 60." But what it's what it'll do if it passes, and it's the community of Maricopa needs it too. But if you ever go over there, there's one way in, one way out on the something eighty seven. Three four over there. So that one and the twenty four. So what the twenty four will do? We didn't bring our big map, Connie. The twenty four will go all the way and connect that parole. <laughs> And that's the bypass that you always hear about. The, the plan for that bypass has been dead since the early 2000s. So those promising they're going to do the bypass, they've been blowing smoke. So it's a bigger, looser bypass. And then in between there, Ray Road will come, which is where gas stations and restaurants will be. But that will be a long time. And then there was something called the North-South, which people didn't vote for. What's the north south? Why should I vote for that? Which well, now been given a name. It's called the 505, which makes sense. You know how you go to the Midwest and they have an outer belt? We are so big and sprawling. We will have an outer, outer belt. You've got I 10 and I 17, and you get the 202 101, the 303, clear out to the 505, which Another thing, we hate the truck traffic in Gold Canyon. When this all gets completed, all the trucks coming in, we'll force them to exit, no truck traffic through 60. They'll have to take 24. They'll then get on 24, get on the 505 or the 202, and they'll be loose in the metro area, which they may even turn 60 over to the county. 60 may become a county road. It'll be a neighborhood road once the 24 connects and the 505, the 505 will go from about where Selling Mountain is, it's where the freeway is. And that's why ADOT still maintains that yard there. That's why that ugly eyesore, when I was mayor, 
Can we please get rid of that? No, we're going to use that in the future. You see the tailings and everything piled there. They'll use that for the construction of the 505, which will head due south. So, like the people in East Mesa A Day have to go, you know, all the way to Florence Junction or down to Florence. It'll just be a straight shot all the way down to I 10. And Santan Valley needs that because there's almost 200,000 people living in Santan Valley now. Oh, it's and the roads weren't planned for. So that 24 and 505 will release, relieve all that and let them just go. And it'll let us go. We'll be able to go to the Arboretum in the winter. The, you know, the residents, oh, and I won't be in office, but we need to force the, the ADOT to make the 24, make the entrance to the Renaissance Festival from the backside mm -hmm. so that they don't even have to go on the street. And people from Glendale and Phoenix, yeah, you know, the 24, instead of coming tediously through the 60, right. you'll just get right off the 24, boom, you're right out in front of the stuff. But Jeff, is question. it going to be five years? Is it going to be oh, 10, that's, 15 years? That's what my but question is. That's going to be on the ballot in 2026, which will jumpstart all of this. Is that a a, a yes or no to have it or a sales tax or something It'll big be, for? They'll probably go, it hasn't been decided yet. It, they'll probably go for another half cent sales mm -hmm. tax. The last time you talked about there was 87 million somewhere that they were looking at potentially allocating towards it, whatever. Do you know what happened to that? Yeah, that's oh. ridiculous because I'm a retailer in my other life. I have a, a retail store. I don't pay sales tax. You pay sales tax when you buy something. They decided to give the money to the retailers. The $87 Walmart million? And oh. uh, Kroger, which is prize. Give it to them. They're the ones that collected them. It's not their money. It needs to go back to the people. But judges, and they decided that. I don't know how, but they don't live in the real world. <laughs> but it, it's not the retailer's money. It's the people's money. It should have gone to the road, work. right? That's what spread it, that out. We're at eighty-seven million on us counting the size of Connecticut doesn't go that far, but that's where it should have gone because the people that passed it intended for it to go to roads. They didn't intend for it to go back to Home Depot and fries. So, so well, it's still in limbo. It's still out there. I wish we could have voted on that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what should happen to the eighty-seven million? Yeah. <laughs> ADOR go to the Department of Revenue sitting on it. I so. see. Mm -hmm. You could have had a bunch of firewise communities. Yeah. Yeah. That's, right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there anything that Pinal County can do with ADOT to get uh, 60 highway between Goldfield and Signal Butte converted to six lane? Well, I grew up in a small community where people like their lawns. So, <laughs> uh, Goldfield to Signal View, that's a ton of money. I mean, ADOT's got that planned out. Joe and Chris, they planned that out how many years in, in advance? Sure. Maybe like 20 years. 20 years in advance. And, uh, Can we get a a um, count of the traffic. I mean, it's a dangerous situation out there. They, and, and all of you that live in Florence or uh, work in Florence in the morning do not experience the thrill that we have. Yeah, they they do have that count. So here's some more political thing that the average people wouldn't know about. There's an organization called MAG, Maricopa County Association of Governments, and all the communities belong to it. And it's always the west side against the east side. And since the west side, when they got the Cardinals, they seem to have more pull and over, over the years, which is why that's all grown up over there. And they, of course, would say, oh, no, that's not true. But, but it is true. So on the east side, on our team, we've got Tempe, Mesa, Chandler, Gilbert, Apache Junction. And of course, they got Phoenix, Glendale, Surprise, all of those over there. And they they fight over that money, and a lot of times they win. Now, we also have something called CAG, which is not very influential. I'm the, I'm the uh, 
to become the member of CAC for our area, which is Central Arizona Association of Governments, which is Superior, Payson, Globe, and, uh, you know, they do some planning also once you get out of here, but MAG plans this. So MAG has a lot of influence with ADOT. And uh, another, another positive thing is I-10 is finally being financed. I-10 between Phoenix and Tucson. That one's been, that's where all the talk has been about widening and they want to widen the 17. If you ever watch the news on a holiday weekend, 17 is a standstill. You don't ever want to go up there. But now that the 10 has been kind of financed, I think that brings the 24 and the 347 to the top because we're next on their list. But I don't ever hear them talk about widening the road you're talking about. I think they just narrow down right here to see the view. Well, you would think they would uh, add more lanes because on Ironwood there, they're adding 30,000 more homes there. Yeah. Not all of them are going to take the 24. Right. Most of them are going to go up probably on Ironwood. Yeah, we don't have any, any cops here, but yeah, the, the intersection of you know, to get on the freeway that come from Queen Creek and they come in and loop around the high school and come back and do U-turns. Cops could write tickets there all day long for that. And uh, yeah, it's, it's terrible. And we're always about 20 years behind on roads, especially in Santan Valley. When Santan Valley was developed, it was George Johnson, you know, Johnson Utilities, Johnson Ranch, the developers were kind of the government. They, 40 acres here, 40 acres there. We'll do a road in between. Oh, there's another 40 acres, another bunch of houses. And there was no government to plan. No, no, no. Let's leave it downtown. Let's make sure that's six lanes. A lot of them, it's two lanes down there. And, you know, that's why it would have been nice for Gold Canyon to incorporate way back when, you know, to have instead of just one representative. I'm the only representative at this level. You guys should have your own council and mayor. And, but in order to do that, why it won't happen is because you'd have to put a property tax on yourself. Nobody's going to vote for a property tax. And you don't have enough businesses to do a sales tax. Your little batches can't finance a city government. You know, so, But that's why it's good that the county's getting Nicola and Lucid, the electric plants. And if you drive down Ironwood, did you see that massive building down there? That's the LG battery factory. And uh, that's gonna that's gonna help also. And once those things start kicking in, like back when I was a councilman and mayor, you you every year you go to this thing called Arizona League Town and Cities and you rub elbows with all the other mayors, etc. And Chandler, they just didn't understand why. We struggle, why can't you build this part? Chandler has Intel. Mm -hmm. Intel is billions and billions of dollars. Anything they want. Oh, we need a new fleet. Yeah, there you go. And we we incrementally do our parks. You know, you do this, well, we're gonna do a parking lot, then we're gonna do a gazebo. And it was a big deal. But once all these things start kicking in, like LG, and there's possibly a data center coming down towards Florence, which will be in our district as well. And, and I, if we had that map again, we don't need any more houses out here. We need employment. So those buildings, which are just a couple stories tall, if you can have everybody from San Diego Valley here, just drive up there instead of in Maricopa County, that would alleviate a lot of the traffic too. And so, but all this is what, 10, 20 years out. And I just had a birthday with my. <laughs> hey, Jeff, I have a question for you. Yes. Um, uh, uh, last year, I heard some some uh, talk going around about maybe some investment in bicycle trails, road bike uh, within Gold Canyon. Um, but then I haven't heard anything in a, in a while. Do you know if anything is coming our way in terms of new bicycle paths, maybe out on 60 or some way for us to get out of? Gold Canyon by bicycle? I don't believe so, no. I will insert that we are trying to, uh, through my office, we're trying to tweak the route of the uh, Lost Dutchman Marathon so that it would run 
instead of on the roads running along the side on the power lines, which that one day of the year, people complain about it, just like they're complaining about the ditching on Peralta Road. But we're always trying to make that better. And uh, Sydney Apache Junction has an awesome parks and recreation department if you go to the parks and uh, whatever. But it would be nice. You're right. I, their their uh, trails are, are actually quite a bit better over there. It's it's noticeable. There are a number of nice nice bike paths and so forth there. Yeah, but that would be nice to interconnect with Gold Canyon so that you could go, you know, through the, the back way to Apache Junction. Yeah, yeah. Currently, we have to go out on the 60, and it's, uh, well, it's, it's a little it's dangerous to be out there with the dump trucks and the uh, uh, big semis and so forth if you're just on a bicycle. So maybe along that power line, you know, that would come by like Silly Mountain, and you get behind Silly Mountain, too. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's not a long way that would need the trail for sure. I contacted Connie to see if, can you figure that? Yes. Yeah. Well. See, that's another oh. the thing with, if you have a government, you can have your own parks and recreation. The county is not in the business of having parks and recreation. Sure. We do build regional parks, but we don't do little parks like a city does. And that's the kind of thing that, that they do. And but but ADOT doesn't take any responsibility for transportation other than those things oh, with, with yeah. engines in them. Yes. And, and then also highway patrol, DPS, they should be the ones patrolling state land too, and they won't. I'm from Ohio originally, and they're the state troopers. They don't just stay on the freeway. They don't go on any state highway and write tickets, et cetera. And they should actually... Hire a couple instead of just having those Crown Victorians, they should have some SUVs and they should be patrolling the state land and give them guns. There's some people out there now, there's like three in the whole state, and they don't even let them have firearms. Can you imagine coming up on an encampment of homeless, not, not necessarily homeless, just tents and whatever without a firearm? No. So, yeah, there's a lot of things that. We don't have interconnectivity and cooperation on the uh, fire departments is one of the best things the way the different departments respond to each other and help each other out. If if all the departments would function like they do, it would be it would be way better. Do we have any regional fog on the top? Any more um, out here? Yeah. Well, of course we have that we have for all the capability. Yeah, and then there's built one over at Maricopa. Yeah. Uh, ours is going to be the best days in this one. Because we have all the cool stuff. We have the mountains, we have the vegetation, the lakes, the events over here. The rest of the county is kind of boring. All these things. <laughs> it's flat and cotton and stuff. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if we're going to put it in the road next summer or we the trail. Not next summer. I've got pushed back to win for all the following spring. When? Uh, yeah, the last half, I think it's 26, 27, the pavement. Well, another big, another big. Well, uh, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is long to give us the flat. Yeah. Another big tax generator, if it ever gets open, and it's been almost 20 years now, Resolution Copper, which is in our district. And that would generate a lot, a lot of jobs and a lot of copper. You know, why buy it from South America when they have to make it right here? Uh, Superior Flourish again. Superior was a nice, classic town in the 40s and 50s. And if we look at some of them big old buildings up there, just imagine that would all come back. Plus, we would get that from county for things like the bike trails and parks and whatever. And uh, we are. Um, one of my goals, Joe, I've been put into this, right, is to have a parks director. Right now it's called open space and trails, and then we add parks. But we really need to to add a ranger too, to, you know, and have and you'll see a vehicle that will say for now county parks on it and, and give them the authority to do this stuff on the road, road etc. So, but we're we're almost there. We've been a we've been a poor county for forever, but we're almost to 500,000 people, and uh, things are changing, you know, and the, the next generation is going to, we hope to hand off a pretty nice county to it. Thank you, Jim.
Well, I just, I want to thank everybody and thank Jeff, John, Zach, and Alan, but I did want to let you, remind you that the material is going to go out. And so we talked about, we have varying support or, you know, it's a concern with the airport training. I did find the video in the EIS material. So I'll send that as well too. That was developed by the Air Force. And then this link, so whether you're in support or not by October 9th, so that's an important date. And also Jeff, you mentioned you went to like e Eli Crane and our representatives. So uh, the folks could also- Yeah, the senators, nobody's really contacted Mark Kelly or Kirsten Cinema. Okay, so, so they could be a contact. Kelly or... was in the, the Navy or Air Force, that might be a good, if anybody, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And um, so I want to thank everybody. We have one more handout to give out out the door. Help yourself to some water. And if you want any more birthday cake, and again, happy birthday, Jeff. But thank you, everybody, for coming this evening. Thank you. 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 Yeah. 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 Yeah.